Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 20. Bloody News. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Last week, we covered the events on the ground as the Irish Rebellion kicks off. After the failure of the coup d'etat in Dublin, and the success of the Rising in Ulster, the Kingdom of Ireland looks set for a bloody civil war, as resentments and grievances exploded in levels of violence not seen for decades. That's not to say that Ireland had been peaceful up until this point, As we saw a few episodes back, the Dublin government had to suppress localised rebellions since the end of the Nine Years' War, 40 years previously. But what now spread across the kingdom was unrest at a national level, and with it came mass killings and the expulsion of civilians. English, Scottish, Welsh and Gaelic-Irish alike, as both rebels and government forces, committed atrocities against those they perceived as enemies. The number of dead from these early months will never be truly known, but it is certainly in the high thousands. Many were killed in high-profile massacres, such as at Portadown, where settlers were stripped and forced into the icy river ban, and shot when they attempted to escape. Prisoners were often summarily executed, peasants arbitrarily killed by government punitive expeditions, and countless civilians died from exhaustion or exposure while fleeing, or from disease while besieged. We left off last time as the news of events in Ireland filtered back to Britain, because as terrible as events were in reality, to once again quote Mark Kishlansky, what really happened in Ireland was of less significance than what people in Scotland and England believed had happened. The reports fed on a healthy diet of anti-Catholic hysteria, the panicked and lurid accounts of refugees, and the breakdown of government censorship mechanisms reached biblical levels of atrocity. Real Old Testament stuff. These reports, printed in pamphlets and news sheets, flew off the presses. Many of these were unlicensed, but like I mentioned, the controls which normally policed such illegal presses were collapsing. The flurry of pamphlets and the appetite for political debate during the last few years had overwhelmed the meagre censorship apparatus. In England especially, accounts of the dramatic events in Ireland were the hot topic for printers. Some of these publications were fairly bland, most of the news books fall into this category. They were merely retellings of the quote-unquote facts of the matter, though with a healthy dose of exaggeration for effect. Others were much, much more rabid, the Daily Mails and Fox Newses of the 17th century. Their pages screamed about the atrocities against innocent Protestants by the barbaric Catholics. They blended fact and fiction, with concerns about the amount of each taking a backseat to producing the most lurid, the most horrific, the most entertaining, the most sellable story. As the weeks went on, and the appetites of readers had been wet by the early reports, printers and pamphleteers were aided by the ever-increasing number of accounts making their way across the Irish Sea. Daily, new prints would appear, detailing the extreme acts perpetrated against the settlers by the Irish, often with accompanying gruesome illustrations. As you might imagine, there was little appetite for fair and balanced reporting of the events, and it was rare for reports to detail the Dublin government's retribution. When they did, it was invariably depicted as justice being done. The magnitude of this hysteria got so high that in 1643, the House of Commons reported that more than 150,000 settlers had been murdered by the rebels. Such a vast number would have been quite the bloody achievement for the rebels, considering that they'd apparently killed more settlers than had ever been in Ireland. The atrocities committed against Protestants, or rather the atrocities alleged to have been committed against Protestants, played into the prejudice and paranoia within English and Scottish society surrounding Irish Catholics. Not only were they 
duplicitous traitors who answered to Rome, but they were barbarians in need of civilising. So the most flamboyant reports didn't merely say that British settlers had been killed. No, they went into exquisite detail. I'll give you a few examples, though I should warn listeners that there will be references to violence against civilians, against children, and acts of sexual violence. Feel free to skip ahead a minute if you'd prefer not to listen. The pamphlet, Bloody News from Ireland, was printed late in 1641, and it recounted the testimony of a recently arrived refugee from Armagh. The Irish were, quote, putting men to the sword, deflowering women, and dragging them up and down the streets and cruelly murdering them, and thrusting their spears through their little infants before their eyes, and carrying them up and down on pike points, end quote. Official correspondence, such as a letter from Sir John Clotworthy, the Irish MP, didn't spare the details either. He described, quote, the great and barbarous cruelties acted upon the Protestants in Ireland, which included, quote, hanging of them and pulling their flesh from their bones, cutting off their heads, hands and feet, unripping of women great with children, and killing the children, end quote. His letter had been addressed to his colleagues in the English Parliament, though it eventually was leaked to the press, or something purporting to be the letter was leaked to the press. It was published as Worse and Worse News from Ireland, and it goes on to add further detail. Men and boys were being castrated, ears were cropped, fingers and hands cut off, people were being blinded either by having their eyes burnt out or pulled out, Children were being boiled alive in front of their mothers. Hundreds of civilians were being impaled. Like I said, biblical Old Testament stuff. It should go without saying that most of these atrocities did not happen. Or at least, they prove impossible to corroborate with the surviving accounts. Mostly, they appear to be sensationalised versions of actual events, events that were plenty bloody and traumatic without the added tabloid spice, or invented out of whole cloth. There were some attempts to crack down on the more extreme fabrications. Two Cambridge undergraduates were arrested for inventing the story printed in Bloody News from Ireland, for example. Sometimes readers showed some scepticism, such as with tales where the Irish brutally and cruelly kill everyone in the story, one might wonder how the printer heard about such events when the evil Irish had apparently killed all the witnesses to their crimes. Did they write in, agony aunt style? Dear Deirdre, I slaughtered a new English family and cooked and ate their infant daughter. What should I do? These exaggerations built on existing themes. There are a lot of similarities between the accounts which appeared in these pamphlets about the Irish and those which had circulated for decades about the Turks in the Balkans. These were the tropes of barbarism, recognisable to and expected by the reader, that, while having a core of truth, had escalated in the telling. Similar claims of atrocity by Catholics against Protestants were a staple of pamphlets reporting on the Thirty Years' War. With this context, and set against a backdrop of paranoia about a Catholic conspiracy, it's not surprising that the reaction to the rebellion was hysterical. So, with all of this in mind, the reports of massacres of innocents, of cruelty beyond imagination, came the bombshell. On the 4th of November, the Irish rebel leadership issued their declaration that they were acting on the orders of the king. That Charles had granted them a royal commission to seize the kingdom and to use force to do it. Of course, he'd done no such thing. But in this chaotic moment, with Charles' relationship with his English and Scottish subjects the most strained it had ever been, the lie found fertile soil. So let's now go back a few episodes to where we last left Charles, in the Scottish Parliament, in the aftermath of the incident. He had capitulated to the Covenant demands, and it seemed like a lasting peace had been established. Alexander Leslie, now Earl of Leven, expressed his hope of returning to the European War. The Palatinate still needed to be restored to its rightful holders. King Frederick was long dead by this point, and now the titular elector Palatine was the 23-year-old Charles Louis. As it happened, Charles Louis and his younger brother Prince Rupert of the Rhine were in the Stuart kingdoms, and were present in Scotland with their uncle. Of course, 
They'd been long trying to bend Charles's ear towards renewing his efforts to restore their position in the Holy Roman Empire. Levin now wished to take his victorious Covenant army to their aid, to rejoin his friends in Swedish service and march for the wider cause of Protestantism. It's very likely that the arrival of the Covenant army, led by Levin and his generals, would have put a serious dent in the Habsburg success. Whether they could have marched all the way to Heidelberg and placed the young elector back on his throne is another question. But fate intervened. Dramatic news from Ireland put an end to that flight of fancy. Tens of thousands of Protestants, many of them Scottish Presbyterians, had been slaughtered. Or so the reports said. The rebels had swiftly seized much of Ulster, with only a few strongholds staying out of their grasp. Now, the clear destination for the Covenant of Force was much, much closer to home. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code RecordedHistory. Babbel language for life. Over the winter of 1641-2, and into the spring, a deal was hashed out to dispatch 10,000 men from the Covenanter army to Ulster. This would be paid for by the English Parliament, and it would be charged with protecting the surviving settlers from the rebellious Irish. Naturally, Alexander Leslie, the Earl of Leven, was appointed to lead this force. He had resigned his commission as Lord General once the peace with Charles had been agreed, and was duly awarded with a substantial parliamentary gift of 100,000 mercs, a seat on the Scottish Privy Council, and the governorship of Edinburgh Castle. He was over 60 at this point, with most of his life spent on campaign. Notwithstanding his open desires to return to serve in the Thirty Years' War, no one would blame him for wanting some time off. But his retirement was cut short. Only in death does duty end, and Leven was far from dead. He was by far the most accomplished military commander in Scotland, and while he had his talents in the political arena, he was a soldier first, last, and always. But Leven was not the only accomplished commander the Covenanters had, and he was wise enough to delegate. Major General Robert Munro once again returns to our story. He commanded the initial expeditionary force to Ireland, and he landed at Carrickfergus on the 3rd of April 1642. Joining up with the local Protestant forces, Munro went on the offensive. Remember how the Covenanters behaved while campaigning in England? Discipline tightly enforced, violence against civilians and looting was kept to a minimum and punished with summary execution. Scottish commanders paid for their supplies, and then Lord General Leslie insisted that he pay any outstanding debts as they withdrew. As far as invasions go, it was essentially polite. The same cannot be said for the Covenanter campaign in Ulster. Marching south, Monroe recaptured County Down in a campaign dominated by skirmishes with rebel forces. When the army recaptured the town of Newry, 60 townsmen were summarily executed, while a number of women were forced into the Clanry River to drown. 
Irish rebels who fell into Covenanter hands were often tortured and executed after being captured. Raiding parties spread out from Newry, embarking on terror campaigns of indiscriminate killings of men, women and children. A large proportion of the Covenanter expeditionary force was made up of Campbells, and they eagerly carried on their feud against the rival MacDonald clan. During the Bishop's Wars, Argyll had led his soldiers on a brutal pacification campaign against those MacDonalds still in Scotland. Now, the Campbells within the Covenanter forces sought to complete the job, persecuting those MacDonalds on this side of the North Channel. As you might expect, the local Protestant forces who joined up with the Covenanters took the lead on many of these atrocities. They'd been on the back foot for months, many of them were refugees from the rebels, and eagerly took the chance for revenge that the arrival of the Covenanters provided. Indeed, one of Monroe's officers blamed these local forces for the worst atrocities, though he was likely attempting to shift some of the blame. What explains the change in behaviour of the Covenanter troops? Firstly, the most egregious reports of rebel Irish atrocities were just as eagerly consumed in Scotland as they were in England. The Covenanters crossed the sea with these terrible accounts in mind. Secondly, they were fighting a largely Catholic force, whereas in England, despite fears of Laudian reform, they were surrounded by fellow Protestants, though ones which could of course benefit from further reform along the lines of the Kirk. The barbaric, popish Irish were not deserving of this gentle touch. There's also the fact that many of the Covenanter troops would know, or know of, fellow Scots who had settled in Ulster, and had either been killed or otherwise affected by the rebellion. As we'll touch on shortly, though, the rage of the Covenanters would burn itself out over time. After capturing Newry, a garrison was left to hold it, and Monroe returned north into County Antrim. Monroe pacified the county, garrisoned the town of Colrain, and arrested the Earl of Antrim himself, Randall MacDonald. Many of Antrim's tenants had joined the Rising, though he had convinced some of them to abandon the cause, and this combined with his Catholicism made him suspect. He was imprisoned in Carrickfergus Castle. From this point, Monroe's series of successes began to slow. Despite the deal with the English Parliament, his troops were increasingly underpaid and underprovisioned. Monroe and the soldiers under his command increasingly wrangled with the question of loyalty. Who did he ultimately answer to? Scotland? The King? The English Parliament, which was meant to be paying them? Or his newfound Protestant allies in Ireland? Monroe will spend upwards of six years in Ireland, and he'll face these problems for much of his time there. After a few months of uncharacteristically brutal conduct, the professional element of the Covenant of Force began to reassert itself. Again, lessons from the Thirty Years' War came to the fore. From Monroe downwards, it was acknowledged that perhaps mass execution of prisoners and indiscriminate slaughter of civilians might not be a sensible policy. After all, despite their initial successes, the end of the Irish War was nowhere in sight. All that orgy of violence had done, aside from avenge alleged atrocities, was stir up more resistance. Aside from any moral or strategic concerns, there was also the strong motivation of self-interest. The longer they spent in Ireland, the more likely it was that Covenanter troops, or even their officers, would fall into the hands of the enemy. If the Covenanters continued to mercilessly slaughter their own prisoners, why wouldn't their enemies do the same? This was another of the lessons of the Continental War. If you treat your enemies mercifully, they are more likely to do the same. If you already kill them out of hand, not only do you motivate them to do the same to you, but there's no reason for them not to. What are you going to do if they kill their prisoners? Kill your own in retaliation? You're already doing that. So gradually, the worst excesses were reined in by the officers, and similar discipline was established by Confederate Irish leaders, which we'll cover another time. By the end of the year, the Covenanter army usually released their prisoners, or put them to work building fortifications while they awaited a prisoner exchange. Wanton slaughter took a back seat to pragmatism, though it never fully went away. Lord General Leven finally arrived in Ireland on the 4th of August, as the Covenant of Force came to full strength. Leven inherited the problems his subordinate had been wrangling with in his absence. His men and officers were disgruntled by the lack of pay, and the deteriorating situation in Britain was not helping the question of loyalty. 
Levin led two campaigns against the rebels over the next two months, but both times he found the experience frustrating. At no point did Levin manage to repeat the overwhelming victory he'd enjoyed at New Bern. Despite the morale issues amongst his men, he would have likely been victorious in a pitched battle. The problem was that the Irish rebels wouldn't give him one. Whenever he marched against one of the rebel armies, they simply broke up and retreated from him, only to regroup later on. The enemy will not be caught, but at his advantage, he complained. How very inconsiderate of them. Frustrated by the enemy, and by his own men, Levin would abandon the Irish theatre in October. He would remain the official commander of the Scottish force in Ireland until 1648, but he would never return to lead it. That would be left to Munro. A contemporary would quip that this new Earl of Leven was much less impressive than Lord General Alexander Leslie had been, and Professor David Stevenson considers that now he had achieved fame, fortune, and a noble title, he didn't have the drive or the interest in, quote, becoming bogged down in an unwinnable provincial campaign, end quote. Leven would not sit idle, though. By this point, England had erupted into civil war. Next week, we will return to England, as Charles does the same. Much like in Scotland, it was agreed that the Irish Rebellion had to be put down. Unlike in Scotland, though, the question of who would lead the army, and who the army would answer to, was not a simple question. Would it be commanded by the king, as tradition dictated, but who had been incriminated in the rebellion by the rebels themselves, and who had a history of attempting to use military force against political enemies? Or would the army answer to Parliament, which was increasingly dominated by the unpopular junto, and which had already displayed its desire to sideline the king from governance? Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoy the podcast, please share it with a friend or on social media. That's the best way to help it grow and to keep it going. Thank you to my royal favourite, Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner, the Duke of Argyle, Owen Cotton, and the Duke of Bracewell, David Braswell. Remember that you can join their ranks at patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Every patron gets an ad-free feed, as well as the warm knowledge that you're helping me keep the lights on. Thanks again to my entire House of Lords, to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the interval music used in today's episode, and, as always, to you for listening. <laughs>